Um, into the into next, the next life, life with, with Drew, Drew and, and me. Okay. Thank you guys for joining us today. Welcome to the Drew and Me podcast. Today, we are joined by local Philly podcaster and blogger, Garrett Smith. Thank you, Drew. What's up, dude? Not too much. Welcome to the show, Garrett. Um, Are there any podcasts or shows that you're coming up that you'd like to promote? Yeah, uh, I do a podcast with my partner, uh, Tori Potenza. She is also a writer for moviejohn.com, uh, which is where you can find most of what I write. Um, but we do a podcast called Killer Bees. You can find us everywhere on the internet at Killer BS Podcast. I'm sure from this game show like tone, you can tell I am, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we, B movie and genre icons. Uh, we just released an episode on Bill Paxton. Um, we've done episodes on Pam Greer, Michael Kaji, um, John Saxon, all kinds of people. Uh, we have a bunch more. We're currently working on a Keith David episode. Um, so Ooh, people wow. should uh, check us out. Uh, Killer Bees podcast everywhere online. Very cool. Um... I'm personally a heavy Spotify user, so I might check it out on Spotify. We're there. You can find us there. Very cool. Am I allowed to advertise uh, these beers on your podcast? You can advertise anything you'd like. <laughs> I'm, I'm drinking a Goose Island IPA. It's uh, tasty. Goose Island Pride of Sh- Chicago, I think. Is that true? Probably. I don't know. It probably says that somewhere on this can, right? Yep, Chicago. Uh, and Baldwinsville, New York, and Fort Collins, Colorado. You're probably right. It probably started in Chicago because I listed that first. Okay. Um, very cool. Um, this can would like you to drink Goose Island and enjoy <laughs> responsibly. The enjoy responsibly is the most important part. I'm locked inside my house, baby. I'm not going anywhere. It's the <laughs> place I could be right now. Uh, all right. Um, so this episode, we are going to be talking about Val Kilmer movies. We are going to be talking about music that both um, me and Garrett like very much. And we'll be doing a sketch. Um so we will be talking about the Val Kilmer movies, Batman Forever, and The Doors. Both yeah. very good movies, um, both very underrated movies, extremely underrated, actually. Um, Doors, I believe, was 91. Batman Forever was 95. That sounds right to me. Drew, hold on. I can pull that stuff up. I got, do you okay. use Letterboxd, Drew? Um, you know what that is? I've been on it a few times. Um yeah. I've read your reviews on Letterbox, Garrett. They're very cool. Um, oh, thanks. I yeah, think you, you were need... correct, by the way. The Doors, 1991, Batman Forever, 1995. Okay. Um... okay. <laughs> I got that information um... from Letterbox. That was why I asked. Sorry, yeah. Uh, which is like Goodreads oh, movies. That's re- really cool. Um, I actually didn't know they also provided that um yeah it's got like a like a diary um, function and so like i log everything i watch and since i watched these movies on the same day a week ago i just jumped to that day and found both of their years sitting right here so that's really cool um pretty good website another free advertisement here on uh (laughs) what is it the good life with drew what was it called the into into the life the drew and me podcast the drew and me podcast okay i got it all right i'm the me part (laughs) Yep, you are the me, I am the the Drew. Drew. And on the Drew and Me podcast, we talk about music, movies, whatever else we would like to talk about, and we do sketches. All right, all right, cool. Now I'm locked in. Okay, so let's jump in right to the heavy meat. Let's do Batman Forever. Um, Okay, Uh, dude, and that is the heavy meat. That... (laughs) 
That's the heaviest of meat. This is like, <laughs> this is leather daddy Batman. And I mean that as a sincere compliment. Like the shot of Val Kilmer's butt in leather is one of the horniest things I've seen in a movie. And it, I love it. Like I, and I mean this genuinely, I like, oh man, I really love how horny this movie is for Batman and the idea of like, where like secretly wearing a leather costume at night and that being like a dangerous part of your 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 lifestyle you know yeah that's actually a really good place to start because the tim burton batmans were really dark but with schumacher with joel schumacher kind of taking the helm you can see them getting more sexual and more for sure sexualized um not necessarily in a negative way, right. just I would say more kind of present and more kind of free and more open. And I think this type of movie would go over well if, if, if it was released for the first time today, I think it would get an interesting reception because yeah. I, think, I think people are far more tolerant of like sexuality and like personal choices than they used to be like because you watch shows like RuPaul's Drag Race and things like that and people are a lot more comfortable with sexuality being shared free and openly than they used to be so I I I think this movie could come back I I totally agree with that and I I do actually think it's kind of being reappraised right now a little bit especially because like um, you know, Schumacher uh, has been like really open about like his own kind of like sexual identity and experiences and how that has like influenced some of his movie making and stuff. And like, I think there's like a pretty clear like queer subtext to this movie um, that I think is kind of being reappraised like right now as we speak. You know what I mean? Like, I, mm-hmm. I think that um, there is a little bit of uh, like a reclamation project going on with this movie. And what I think is interesting is that, like, you know, I do really like that stuff about the movie. Um, I I like that it's, like, kind of into the idea of Leather Daddy Batman. Um, (laughs) But, like, I also think that, like, it's a good movie that, like, for a long time was considered, like, a bad movie. But, like, I actually think the performances are really good in this movie. I think the script is just, like, lean and mean and pretty tight. And it's just very clearly going, like, we're taking the Tim Burton aesthetic, but we're winding the clock back to like a little bit more like the 1960s goofy Batman. Like we're still going to kind of use the aesthetic established by, by Burton in these movies, but we're going to bring the tone a little bit back into like the absurd, like the sort of silly absurdity of like the, the 60s TV show. I, I dig that. and, And I think that like, you know, in a world where now we have what, like six or seven different live action versions of Batman, there's so much room for there to be these like different tones of Batman. Yeah. When I think at the time it was like, they've just, they've done him wrong. They've done something wrong to Batman, you know? Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. Um, I remember, um, I remember seeing this movie in the theater. This was maybe one of the first movies I saw in the movie theater. Yeah, I was four. Um, my parents probably shouldn't have brought me. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure I was four when the Turtles, uh, and that was the first movie I saw in theaters. So same diff. <sighs> um, yeah, the 90s was a different time. And if it was marketed towards kids, you'd assume it's okay. You know? Okay. <laughs> Also, dude, there were like RoboCop action figures. They also just straight up marketed R-rated movies to children. Yeah, that's a really good point, Garrett. And that was thing I was thinking about yesterday. If you were to rate this today with how sexualized it is. Yeah, yeah. I think it would at least get a, it, well, is it a PG-13 movie? I yeah, guess I, I think don't it's know. PG-13. It I would definitely it at least be PG-13. So you think it might go full R though? I don't know that it has enough maybe on screen for it to get the r rating r maybe a light r in today's culture with like how rampant uh you know sexuality and nudity is on like netflix and hbo maybe people have gotten more liberal with movie ratings but i don't know i think chris o'donnell would have had to like kiss val kilmer on the lips for them to like fully give it an r rating yeah um no no 
in rewatching this like yesterday, I, I was really surprised with how sexual definitely and like Chase yeah like he, Mer- chase meridian he, is too yeah i was gonna say even the chase meridian stuff is like she is she is also really into this like leather bound dude and like <sighs> seems to find herself like surprised to be like as turned on as she is by yeah. um you know not just this guy that looks like this but this guy that operates like this too right like she's yeah. Uh, she's supposed to be is she a psychiatrist or a psychologist they they call her dr chase meridian so i think she's a psychiatrist a psychiatrist okay um and and like you know she seems to be surprised to find herself so interested in i think what she would classify as like a deviant behavior right like i think she Mm. would I, i think that's like kind of what they're going for with her character is that like if she were to diagnose this guy, she'd say that it's, he's like deviant in some way, but she's like, obviously like very, at least sexually attracted to him. Yeah. um, Very much so. And also I think it's like, there's a line where she says hot entrance. So (laughs) he's doing something she can't like, I guess she couldn't enter that way. And she's a very athletic person. She says she likes rock climbing. Right. she's punch she's doing a punching bag when oh yeah val camer val Kimmer, bruce wayne pretty much breaks into her office because he <laughs> thinks he's struggling which um Sorry, i forgot about that he straight up kicks the door down yeah. like literally off of the hinges right yeah like then she's like you can afford to buy me a new door which is like uh yeah um he can i do, I do like <laughs> that she's not like man you just fully kicked my door off of its hinges i wonder if the leather daddy that i've been seeking you know what i mean like how do you not put these things together um you know what i didn't think about it that way but um she she's definitely a hardcore character and i think chase meridian deserved more of an arc in the Batman canon because I think she's really interesting. Totally. Uh, like in general, like I, I, I'm sure there are, I, I don't know a ton about DC. I've read like a fair share of Batman, but I'm not like a huge, uh, I don't read comics regularly. So there are tons of arcs that I've not read. So maybe Chase Meridian has that arc and I, and I don't know it, but I'm not even really familiar with that character name outside of this movie really. Uh, um, same, you know, and yeah, and they don't give her a lot to do. I mean, it's like it is the yeah. shame of this Batman franchise outside of Batman Returns, which we can talk about in a second. Um, the 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 female characters really are like underserved by this iteration of of the Batman franchise. I think, except Batman Returns, which really is a Catwoman movie and is a really fucking good Catwoman movie and has like a lot of interesting stuff for Michelle Pfeiffer to do. Um, so yeah. I, I, I do think that movie does well by it's like main female protagonist, this movie, not so much. Yeah, she's kind of, in this movie, she's kind of just an accessory to Bruce Wayne, which, and Catwoman is her own thing, like completely yeah. in Batman return. She is her own thing. She is independent. Uh, I mean, that she, movie is practically about her in my opinion. Like when you, when you watch that one now, it's like she is without a doubt the most compelling part of that movie. And she really does have like as much of the screen time as Batman, if not more. Like, Batman hardly has any yeah. screen time in that movie because it's also a Penguin movie. They like, they go hard on that Penguin stuff too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Michelle Pfeiffer doesn't get enough credit for how, at, at the time, I think she was very critically lauded for how good her performance is in batman returns but yeah whew, just a tour de force performance just like a virtual just incredible like she rocks just like, i mean it, it's so physical as well as like so much acting yeah. you know what i mean it's like it's such an yeah. interesting performance um i remember watching an interview with tim burton and he said that what really impressed him about Michelle Pfeiffer is when she had to swallow a bird and she had a bird inside her mouth for, I think it was like seven seconds. And he said that really impressed him. Yeah, so it's wild. 
if you impressed Tim Burton, you've done something right. Because yeah, if you've impressed Tim Burton, you've swallowed a bird in front of him. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that impresses Tim Burton. That is right in line with that dude. And um, uh, just kind of getting back Batman Forever. Um, in listening to the music, like it kind of had like Tim Burtony kind of Nightmare Before Christmas theme music, and he is also a producer on the film. So. I think this whole He's not I, think, gone. I think even through Batman and Robin they are I think they're all Tim Burton produced. They're all meant to be part of the same kind of canon or or movie universe. Um, yeah. Uh, like th- this is ostensibly meant to be the same Batman as as um Michael Keaton's Batman is is my understanding of it. Yeah. Which is interesting when Val Kilmer says he had, in the movie he says he hasn't had much luck with women because I know he and Vicky Vale there was something there and then he and Catwoman there was yep. well for actual romance Vicky Vale for rival I, I'd say Catwoman but also romance because yeah. like. I feel like he was, which I guess we can get into a quick fan fiction, fan theory that I'm just thinking of. So say Catwoman doesn't escape, say Batman says, okay, come with me. And she does. Does he take her to Arkham Asylum or does he get her off in more ways than one <laughs> <laughs> that's so interesting yeah uh honestly I, I think what i want for batman is that he he gets her off in more ways than one as you so aptly put it um and i even think that that's probably the reality right like i think a, i think a lot of batman fans want to think of him as some sort of like like grounded moral compass like he's like very much like a moral being but like i don't really think that's true actually i think he's like a guy that's trying to like insert control into a world that he feels is out of control Mm -hmm. and i think if it benefited him to not send her to jail to not send her to arkham asylum if there was a chance that he thought like well uh, we'll be together and she can still be her and i can still be me but we'll be together so maybe that'll i'm sure he's the type of guy that's like oh that means she'll like change for me a little bit like I think he probably would try and have a relationship with her and not take her to Arkham, even if that's what he should do, is my read on on Batman. I don't know if that's true of the characters in these movies, though. That's just kind of my take on Batman generally. Yeah. Um, Yeah. um, If you look at Batman and Robin, kind of... Poison Ivy, I guess she dies. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not really clear, but right. I, I guess Schwarzenegger comes in, he freezes her. She's frozen for all eternity. Um, I, 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 I guess that's what happens. Which, that's a morbid ending. Like, that is a dark ending. Like, you want a dark Batman ending? <laughs> there you go. Right. Yeah, that is pretty. That's also a. Uh... That's an interesting version of uh, what do they call that? Fridging, where uh, they like kill a female character to motivate a male character. They literally fridge Poison Ivy in that movie. They just freeze her. Oh man. Um. 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 That's interesting. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. Um. Growing up, I also really liked the TV show Batman Beyond, and I was watching an episode recently, a Mr. Freeze episode, and it talked about, it's called The Meltdown, and there's a female doctor who tries to give Mr. Freeze a new body, and he freezes her eventually, and he kills her, so it happened again. Uh, I think that show was also the same creative team as the the batman animated series that was uh you know so popular at the time yeah and um that has that really great uh pretty famous um uh mr freeze arc in it 
um, which I now can't think of the writer's name, but it wouldn't surprise me. Is it me Bruce, if, Tim, and Paul Dini? Yes, Paul Dini. That's exactly who it is. Okay. I would assume Paul Dini also wrote the arc you're talking about in Batman Beyond. That sounds very much like his own continuation of that, uh, that Mr. Freeze arc. That's a good arc, too. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's like, you want, I'd say you want like grade A writing in television. That's high, high up. So for everyone listening, if you haven't seen the Batman animated series, watch the Mr. Freeze episodes. And if you have access to Batman Beyond. I, I know it's not everywhere. I know it's not streaming everywhere, but if you've access to it, check out the Mr. Freeze episodes to see the arc. And it's very similar to the arc they do in Batman and Robin. So yeah, I think that that it is based on this stuff, isn't it? Right? Like they do yeah. the whole thing with his wife and stuff in that movie. Yeah, I think they created it through the show. Yeah. Right. You're totally right. Like that was something that wasn't originally in the comics, which yeah. Obviously Harley Quinn also not in the comics. And also, another... also a Paul Dini creation, right? I think she's also a Paul Dini character. Yeah, and a brilliant character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and absolutely brilliant character who's originally a doctor. Um, right. Yes, that's right. Harley Quinzel. Um, yeah. Hey, have you seen just while we're on the subject? Have you seen Birds of Prey? I have seen Birds of Prey. Dude, that um, movie kicks ass. I liked that movie so much. I love the action. Yeah. Um, I love how it's shot. Aside from the face peeling off stuff, yeah, yeah, it's it's not super gruesome. So honestly, just cut that scene, and kids can probably watch it. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I just I really liked that movie. I, I I thought that was like I don't know that movie has like a real energy to it that I think a lot of the uh, current uh, superhero fare lacks. I don't even know how to describe that beyond that, but there's something really fun and entertaining about that movie. It has a lot of style. Um, yeah. And that's something that Shazam did too. And I also really liked mm-hmm. Shazam. Um, had a yeah, lot of style. Was cool. Kind of lighthearted with deep messages. Yeah, It's like a lighthearted exterior, but very deep messages. Shazam which... got some cool like horror movie stuff in it too. Like those <laughs> creatures are like pretty really... There's that scene where, like, doesn't somebody's dad get fucking, like, thrown out a window, like, pretty gruesomely at one point? Yeah, um, that's, like, Sam Raimi territory and, right. like, the first Spider-Man. <laughs> totally, totally, yes, yeah. Which, honestly, Sam Raimi doesn't get enough credit for being, would you say, one of the godfathers of modern horror? Oh, for sure. And, like, is, at this point, like, one of the godfathers of the modern superhero movie. Like he didn't, he, he didn't just like, you know, with the evil dead, he kind of like, and especially evil dead Two he kind of like sets this bar for horror filmmaking that the eighties is kind of always chasing in some weird way, but then he does it again in the nineties with Spider-Man. Like we spend the next two decades chasing that, you know, like he, he definitely has kind of like not birthed genres, right? Like these were both genres that, plenty of movies had been made with him before he got to them but in getting to them kind of like i don't know seemed to perfect them in a way for audiences that uh, other filmmakers started chasing or something you know yeah um yeah like action horror and superhero all mixed into one um yeah like the first the first spider-man with the, yeah, the toby mcguire spider-man like that's a really different kind of superhero movie <laughs> um and I, I think it likes it, it resets the bar for what they are like i think superman and batman are the bar prior to that movie mm. and then that movie kind of like resets the bar again and people stop because for a while i mean there are there is a 90s fantastic four movie produced by roger corman that is not good um it's it's fun and funny to watch but it's not great um you know and and like you know people just like by the time we got batman and robin people were like well with it it's like it's it's goofy chintzy crap and with 
uh, you know, movies would follow in those footsteps and eventually we'd get to the MCU off of that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, no, but uh, something that you get in Schumacher movies that you get in Raimi movies is you get really good dialogue. Um, oh, yeah. And it's usually really funny. And um, I really like, especially like you were suggesting, like the scenes between Chase and Bruce, I think are like, they have a pretty fun, like interesting flirty dynamic. I think that Kilmer is great in this movie. I think he might be like the most underrated of the Batmen um, because he's like, kind of underplaying both characters like his bruce is like kind of a quiet man um you know he he doesn't seem to like speak much and unless he really has something to say and then his batman is not i'm bad you know he's not like groveling he's not like giving a full performance he's really kind of also sort of just reserved in that yeah in his presence as Batman. Yeah. And I kind of think it works for like what I understand yeah. about the psychology of Bruce and, and Batman. Yeah. And just a brief Batman comparison. Um, if you were to compare Kilmer's Batman to like Christian Bale's, Christian Bale's Batman voice is kind of more cartoony. Like I feel like it would benefit animation because it's a little bit, gruffer it's a little bit larger it's a little bit bigger Kilmer's is a lot more subtle and you kind of do have to like put your listening hat on but in the bat suit too he has so much good physicality and I know on the audio commentary to Batman and Robin and honestly with a lot of people it depends on the day but you know, that was the commentary for the George Clooney movie, but Schumacher said Kilmer was his favorite Batman. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. And well, I feel like to your point, like um, uh, Christian Bale's version of the character of both characters is performative. His version of Bruce is performative. His version of Bruce is he's performing this like playboy millionaire that he thinks people a want to see but b also sort of further disguises his identity right like the more like a playboy he acts the less people assume that he's batman i think is part of the idea but then his version of batman is equally performative he's doing the big grovelly voice he's trying to he keeps talking about i was trying to scare criminals give them a symbol to be afraid of he's performative yeah. and i don't think kilmer's version of either character is really performative Oh, oh, except in the sense that his Batman is definitely like, I think in this movie, trying to flirt with Chase. And so his Batman is performing the version of himself that his Bruce cannot. His Bruce cannot be exactly who he really wants to be. His Bruce is holding him back from being with someone like Chase. His Batman, he, as Batman, he gets to perform as the man that chase wants and is interested in. Um, and so I guess in that sense, it's like performative, but it's all rooted in this very, in this more kind of um, traumatized uh, psychology, I, I think. Mm, um, that's an interesting way to look at it. I actually didn't think about it that way. Like you can look at, yeah, like, maybe batman has ptsd um i mean for sure i think right i mean he's lit dude he's wearing a fucking costume at night beating people up like that dude is he for sure has got some ptsd issues um yeah and kind of chase does kind of open him up but that is what she does for a living. So right, right. that's right. what she's supposed to do, but he's a tough cookie to crack. So yeah. Oh, I mean, you want to talk about like problematic relationships. Like <laughs> she immediately falls for her patient. Basically he's like, God, I want to bone my doctor. Like so bad. Like it, like it, it's real bad. Yeah. Um, 
And this is kind of a quick aside, but something I also noticed, um, I'm not sure if you've seen uh, the movie uh, uh, Days of Thunder. Um, I've not seen that actually, um, and I have been meaning to. That that's a Tony Scott movie, I think. Yeah, right? Tony Scott. Um, yeah. I heavily recommend it. It is one of my favorite movies. Um, I've been meaning to watch that. I really dig Tony Scott, and I actually kind of like Tom Cruise as an actor. So uh, he's a psychopath as a human being, but I really like him as an actor. Um, it was another movie where Nicole Kidman got to play a doctor. Um, she's also a doctor in Days of Thunder. I don't think I knew she was in that movie. That makes me want to see it even more. I really love her. I think she's great. Yeah. Um, really convincing. Like, super, super convincing. And I think her being, like, my first movie theater experience got me into her from a young age, too. Oh, so for sure. that means she'd be effective with a lot of people around, like, you and I's age, who you know if our first movie theater experience was with nicole kidman then you know she's going to be lucille ball coming up so you know even if you haven't seen i love lucy maybe see the lucy obama movie to get to you know see nicole kidman trying a challenging role (laughs) yeah 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 um yeah, I, I actually, I'm with you, man. I thought this movie was like kind of better than its reputation and better than better. I remembered it. A lot um, better. I, I really dig, I mean, it, it's very garish, but I kind of like that about it. Like, I love how colorful it is. I really like that, like, Lisa Frank, neon lit, black light alleyway fight sequence. I think looks cool as hell. Like I, I kind of like. Oh, and uh, Jim Carrey's performance is also uh, great. I think. Yeah. He is um, fun and funny in this movie. I he feels like a proper Batman villain to me. Like he he really works in this role. And, and you know, like Tommy Lee Jones is good too, but Tommy Lee Jones like feels like he's trying to play a cartoon character. And, you know, just the nature of Jim Carrey, it's like that thing that's so unique and great about him is that, like, he is a living cartoon character. So, like, it doesn't feel... And I, I sincerely mean that as, like, a compliment. Like, he, he, like, is a living cartoon character. And so you don't get that vibe of, like, oh, he's just, like, playing at this. Yeah. He is that, you know? Yeah. Um. So, Garrett, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Okay, please. Um, if you can find the James Lipton, Jim Carrey interview on Inside the Actor's Studio, you get to see Jim Carrey a little bit more reserved, a little yeah. bit more honed in, and a little bit more focused. And it's a treat to watch. And yeah. he takes you through how he created some of his characters, but he's also like a lot more focused and kind of reserved which um in an interview i i I heard someone say on set like jim will read a book or something like he won't necessarily be like on like 24 7 like he'll take some time to like oh i mean read a book or something for sure i mean i think to do what he does um requires a certain amount of energy that you couldn't actually put out all the time right like he's legitimately clowning in like a like a classic sense of that word um, and, I, and I think that requires a lot of energy and, and talent. So it makes sense to me that, um, you know, uh, I guess he's not like actually a clown. You know what I mean? That he's uh, that's like a performative side. Yeah. I think he's terrific in this movie. Mm. Um, <laughs> um, I completely agree. And um. I'm surprised he didn't work with Schum- Schumacher on any more projects because th- this was a very good performance from him. And hold on, Drew, would it surprise you to know? I think I'm right about this. Give me one second. I think okay. he did make one other movie with Joel Schumacher. Oh, I apologize for not getting the information correct. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because it's going to blow your mind when I tell you the title. You're going to be like, I do remember that that was a movie. And you're going to be like, I did not know. He- yes, I'm correct. The number 23. Do you remember that movie? 
No. <laughs> you don't remember it at all, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a weird, like, uh, like horror adjacent movie where uh, Jim Carrey starts going crazy because he keeps seeing the number twenty three anywhere, mm. everywhere, and it must mean something. Uh, so he did, in fact, work with him again in a movie that I don't think many people like. It's um, uh, not a not a well regarded uh, film. Maybe another bring it back candidate or give another look. You know, if it's available on streaming services, yeah, you know, you could rent it. It's probably worth a rent. If you're a Carey fan, if you're a Schumacher fan, yes, probably worth a rent. Now, I haven't seen it, so I don't know how Schumachery it gets, but um. I don't remember this movie very well, uh, if at all. So I would suspect that means it either doesn't get very Schumachery at all, or it just isn't terribly successful at it. But like Raimi, Schumacher does have a bit of a horror pedigree w- w- hmm. with the Lost Boys. Yeah, for sure. Um, and um, oh, what's that other? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I mean, he did an adaptation of um, Phantom of the Opera as mm. well. Um, but uh, oh, eight millimeter is the movie I'm thinking of, which is like kind of a horror movie in its own way too. Yeah, he he definitely has a bit of that pedigree going on. Mm. Um, that's cool. Oh, Flatliners too. I forgot he's Flatliners. That's really cool. Would you recommend Flatliners? Uh, yeah, Flatliners is like uh, definitely like a fun of its era movie, I think. Um, and that cast is, uh, you know, I think very fun to watch, especially now. That's awesome. Um, uh, Julia Roberts was in that, correct? Is she in Flatliners? I'm, I see, I'm bad at this sometimes. I'm like, I, I think so. Some of these movies, it's been like so long since I've seen them that I, I have a little trouble with. Hold on. the Who I can think of in that movie is um, uh, Sutherland. Um, Ooh. Yeah, Kiefer Sutherland. Yes, you're right. Julia Roberts, Kevin Bacon, William Baldwin, Oliver Platt. Yeah. Yeah, That's I don't know how nasty. I forgot Julia Roberts is in that. Kiefer Sutherland and Kevin Bacon is who I was thinking of. Mm. Wow. Um yeah um flatliners was kind of one i always missed which um i think because uh came out in 1990 i think got an r rating so probably a little bit too adult and then if it came on tv i didn't like talk about it with any friends or anything so it, it was never really a movie that i actively pursued but it was something that i have heard mentioned in film circles I'm kind of a horror junkie, so I'm usually in the bag for that stuff anyway. It's like it's not always great to trust me on a recommendation on those because I'm like, if it's a horror movie, I'm like, yeah, three stars, I love it. Like, you know. Um, but I, I think that one, I, I don't know that that movie is a time and place movie, but but a good one. You know, it's like a time capsule that I enjoy. I got you. Um, so. We're just about to get into the uh, sketch portion, um, okay. All right. which um, should be fun. But just um, to talk about uh, w- one of your old podcasts briefly. Um, yeah. Um, on the I Like to Movie Movie uh, podcast with you and Dan Scully, you guys did look at Reanimator, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that movie really freaked me out. Like, did it? did you so much did you see it when you were younger did you see it recently or no i saw it a few years ago and yeah. um i think i watched it in conjunction with listening t- to the podcast um yeah, yeah. so uh and it freaked you out uh yeah um <laughs> well it's just like <laughs> it's so downtrodden and it's so dark and it's so bleak and like i really don't like the way doctors are portrayed in that movie or oh, yeah they're like they're nuts uh, in that movie yeah right they're mad um, scientists more than they are doctors right like that's like 
to give it credit, it is a good 80s. Would you consider it to be a creature feature? Yeah, kind of. I, I think I would call it like a splatter movie, maybe. Um, like it, mm. like it's in the tradition of like the Evil Dead movies where it's like, mm. we just got lots of goopy blood. We're pulling arms off of people and throwing them across the room and blood's like shooting out of like it's like I'm a cannon, you know, like uh, splatter, gore, splatter, gore. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, but um, that was kind of a review that really kind of um, stood out that you guys did and kind of a big subject matter too. Um, yeah. Uh, like really big, like, um, and uh, yeah, um, no, uh, for everyone watching, if you have the stomach for it, check out Reanimator. But oh, it's don't it is show one it to of your kids. Yeah, yeah, no, your children should not watch Reanimator. It is one of my all time favorite movies. Like genuinely, I really, really love that movie. I think it is so much fun to watch. It's very funny, um, but as you suggest, it's. I mean, it is very gory. And uh, so you have to have the stomach for it. I, if you have the right kind of sense of humor, I think you'll find it very, very funny. It's like, it's practically a slapstick cartoon uh, that just happens to be like very violent. Um, and also like needs to have some content warnings on it as well. There's like some sexual violence in it that is very uncomfortable to watch. Um, but it, uh, you know, there is also something about that movie uh, I saw the guy that um, wrote it, Dennis Paoli, I think is his name. Um, I saw him uh, do a Q&A at a screening of that once. Um, and he talked a lot about like sort of some of the thematic work that he was trying to do in talking about like, um, you know, basically like the the bourgeois versus like the proletariat and what that movie is trying to to maybe say about some of those power structures and dynamics um, that I do think are in that movie. But I also think you probably are mostly going to look at it and go like, holy shit, that guy's head popped off of his shoulders, you know? Um, and I kind of like it, but that's like what I love about that movie is that it's like, it's yeah. doing both of those things, you know? Yeah. No, but it is kind of one of those bigger philosophical uh, movies. Yeah. So um, I guess before we put a bow on um batman forever um any big philosophical larger than life takeaways from batman forever yeah um gosh i, I mean mostly frankly mostly i was just like my big takeaway is that this movie is very horny and like very <laughs> i think like queer like queer coded in a lot of different ways and i i I think that it, I hope that it continues to be reappraised um, in both of those lenses because I think that those are, are worthy things for a movie to be and, and be about. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Those are my big, my, my big takeaways from it. Um, um, so you said horny was number one. What was yeah. the number two reason? Uh, number two was just that it's like, I think it's like pretty queer coded in a lot of different ways. And yes, yes. I, I hope that more people kind of investigate that. I don't think I have like the best uh, perspective on that. And I, I hope yeah. that other people kind of like oh, investigate yeah. it more for that. Yeah, right. Um, I agree. But I think that's another reason why it should be revisited. Um, yeah. So I, you know, it gets a bad rap and unfortunately it has a low Rotten Tomatoes score and it hasn't, and it has a low audience score, but I think that's just purists getting, wanting a Tim Burton to direct them all. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's a goofy movie that yeah. knows that it's a goofy movie, but there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. In my opinion, I think it knows it's yeah. having fun and winking at us when it's winking at us, you know? Yeah. And Correct me if I'm wrong, but Schumacher was brought in to make it more accessible to a wider audience, correct? Because 
I don't think Returns made its made as much money as it was supposed to. Oh well, I mean, they re- if I remember correctly, they released Returns as like a Christmas movie, <laughs> uh, and like yeah, it's a dark, twisted, strange. It's like one of the most Tim Burton movies Tim Burton has ever made, actually. Oh yeah, and, yeah, and, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, audiences didn't go for it quite in the way that they went for the other one. And in fact, I don't even know box office wise. My guess is that movie didn't like flop or anything. No, I, I think it just didn't do what they I think they were a little I think they tried to sell McDonald's toys off of a movie that was about like a woman in leather wanting to have sex with a dude in leather. And they were like, we don't know how to do this. Like we need somebody to kind of like we're trying to sell action figures like we need somebody to do that. And then for some reason, hired Joel Schumacher to do that, which is like Joel Schumacher is just as interested, if not more interested in the people in leather wanting to have sex with each other. So like, I do think they like weirdly made a mistake in hiring Schumacher Schumacher for like what their intent was. But you are correct that I do think that was like what was going on. That was like the behind the scenes of like how he ends up involved in this movie. Yeah. And I think if, fans understand that you know maybe they can be a little forgiving and maybe treat it like its own entity or like you know this is the the Schumacher era and it's different he got two movies Tim Burton got two movies that he directed they're both different and just like with Harry Potter if, if you watch the first three they're incredibly different from the latter four like the latter four is this even a Harry Potter movie (laughs) <laughs> because they're like completely different yeah but apparently the books i haven't read all the books but apparently the books do get a lot darker and i i can see that because i i kind of stopped with like part of five and i can see how dark five got so it would make sense they would want the direction to be a little bit mature more mature a little bit more subtle a little bit more bleak <laughs> yeah i think the uh, you know the thing that everybody always talks about with those books is they were meant to kind of grow with the audience that started on them, you know? That's a good point. That's a really good point. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, if JK came out with more Harry Potters, I would definitely read them. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I, uh, I feel like I, uh, I'm not I'm not much of a Harry Potter guy. Definitely not much of a JK Rowling guy myself, but uh, you know, to each they own. Absolutely. Um okay. Uh let's um get started with the sketch portion. Um awesome. Let's see. So is it okay if I share my screen with you? Oh, Derek? that's fine. And I actually I have uh, your script up here on my screen. Um okay. But that yes, sounds... that's that's totally fair. I don't know if that's like helpful to your audience for it to be shared or anything. So do it. Okay. Um, but I do have it here. See. I don't know if you want me to be Fred or uh, or the other guy here. <laughs> um, whichever preference you would like is totally fine. Um. Does not matter to me. Okay. Um, let's take a look. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Um, I'll probably just go to the script. And you said you have a copy. I got it too, here. Right? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. That sounds good. Um. Let's see. Okay. Um. All right. I'll be McFarland. You're cool with being Fred. Yeah, I can be Fred. Okay. Sounds good. Um. All right. Serial mayhem. I'm in a serial mood. What is your favorite cereal? Count Chocula. Ew. Why ew? Because there's nothing to it, just balls of chocolate powder. Balls of chocolate powder or balls of chocolate power? Uh, Irrelevant. Personally, I'm more of a Captain Crunch guy myself. He looks fab in that blue hat. 
what if we combine the two with these powers combined, making Captain Chocula or Count Crunch? Count Crunch for sure. But how does that work? Do vampires eat crunch berries? Do vampires even eat? You must remember that he is a chocolate vampire, so he eats chocolate. So Count Crunch would eat chocolate crunch berries or cherries. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay, that makes sense. Well, while we're on the subject, uh, let's explore some more cereals. Um, What if we combined Lucky Charms and Cocoa Puffs? Cocoa Puffs. Yep, that's the name of the cereal. <laughs> oh, cool, cool. Uh, if we combine the two, we would call them Charmed Cocoa? Lucky Puffs? Indeed. And what special abilities would Charmed Cocoa give you? Magical powers, of course. Interesting. In, in, in interest has peaked. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> And what would these powers do? Kind of a Midas touch, only instead of gold, everything turns to cocoa. And this helps how? Cocoa is a good source of natural sugar and can provide energy. Are you sure? Just sounds like a bunch of cavities waiting to happen. That's why you take it in moderation. Un- understood. And see. Do we like bow? Do you have to bow on the internet? How do you bow on the internet? <laughs> Here we go. And no, for everyone listening, um, if you download, you know, quick ad, um, if you download Keltex or for this, um, uh, I just did very loose formatting on, uh, a Google Doc. So if you guys want to write your own sketches at home, you can just kind of do a Google Doc. Um, there's more proper formatting that I didn't go into. Like there's slug lines and like interior, exterior and cut to and uh, stage direction and what the camera is doing. And there is more to it, but um, no. Um, you don't need any of that to be able to like perform it uh, like we just did, right? Like you can get a sense of like yeah. who, your, who your characters are and what you want them to, to sound like just from kind of putting that on the page like you did. Yeah, it's definitely a good place to start. Um, uh, but for all of our fledgling writers out there, all of... Um, uh, formal is the way to go for submitting um so if you submit sketch packets um yeah definitely formal interior exterior whole nine yards um but keltex oh yeah go ahead oh but um keltex is a very good free software to format um Sometimes it's hard to transfer the Keltex files, but um, it's a very good free formatting software or, yeah. or writing software. And uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, it's pretty easy these days to Google a good example of like what a script uh, looks like for something like this. Um, I, but actually something I did years ago was I bought myself um, a copy of the Ghostbusters shooting script. Oh, yeah. like pl- there's places you can find that stuff online. And I, I, you know, I don't remember how much I spent on it, like 10 bucks or something. And, um, you know, you get the script and it just, it's a great example. You can do it. Just pick a favorite movie and, and Google it, Google the script for it and try and find it. And it'll just give you a great example of like what that stuff actually looks like on the page. Yeah, it's a great, it's another great way to interact with movies. If you guys listening at home, like, like to interact with movies just kind of reading it from a script you can see what the actors get to read um well and even if you're trying to write your own sketch or something it's um you know it's a good way to just look at what that stuff in a full proper formatting kind of looks like you know yeah yeah um (laughs) um (laughs) um 
Uh, you're totally right. Um, I've gone on. IMSDB and it's a really good source um, for looking at film scripts in particular. Um, the 5050 script uh, in original draft, um, 5050, Seth Rogen, Just Gordon Levitt, Anna oh, yeah. Kendrick. Um, it's a good er early draft of that movie. Mm. Was on IMSDB or still there? And um, that was a really cool experience kind of reading that um is there another free online source where you'd recommend looking up scripts well um, i don't know actually um i just have I, i'm a last time i did that was like a decade ago and uh, you know i just went to google and found somewhere that had like a as you're suggesting like a database of them and they usually are like earlier versions of uh drafts too it seems to be what's usually available um but um yeah, no, I don't. I don't know of any uh, off the top of my head. Mm, um, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I might have to do some more research and investigate. But usually, IMSDB is a pretty safe bet, and um, I think it's legal too. So, um, don't quote me on that. Sure. Yeah. But um, uh, it's probably okay. Um, but obviously, do your due diligence, do your research, be as careful as possible. Um, so you know, it's always good to be careful with whatever you look at on the internet. Just be aware of where it is coming from. Um. Okay, that was a good PSA. Um, let's <laughs> let's talk about music. Um, yes. So Garrett and I both selected five songs that we like very much that we're currently into. Um, what is your first song for you, uh, Garrett? Oh, uh, what did I give you first? I think I gave you a King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard song, right? Yeah. Okay uh mars for the rich uh okay king gizzard and the lizard what what do you do do you just like talk about your songs a little bit i don't i don't know how you do this on your show um it honestly kind of varies um okay. uh usually um i like to start with where was the place where you were, where you got really into the song? Like, were you listening to it in a particular place? Uh, so this band, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, are like a uh, like a psych rock band from Australia. Um, I think they're very popular right now. Um, mm. I found them on Spotify, just like listening to, you know, Spotify. I actually kind of like Spotify's algorithm. It's like one of the only algorithms on the internet that I think functions the way I would want an algorithm to. Um, and uh i got you know they just like popped up on a playlist i dug a couple of their tracks i started listening to them and this was all basically during like at the beginning of the pandemic when i was stuck at home for the first time you know it was like we all got stuck at home um me and my partner had just started renting a house together we got you know stuck at home in this uh in the pandemic and i don't know i got really into them and they their output is crazy I think they've released three albums this year already. Um, their output is absolutely wild. And every album sounds pretty different from the rest. And uh, this song is from the only album they've ever made that is just fully a heavy metal album. They're not a heavy metal band, but they just made a heavy metal album. That's really good. Uh, and that heavy metal album is essentially just like a climate change awareness album. Like every song is about like, hey, like the planet is dying and rapidly and we need to do something about that. Uh, and Mars for the Rich is kind of a tongue in cheek song about rich people are probably going to leave the planet and go to Mars and leave the rest of us here to burn alive, uh, <laughs> uh, which is a very heavy metal thing to uh, write a song about. <laughs> uh, and it's got a great riff. I really love uh, good guitar riffs. It's got a great central riff. Uh, it's like my favorite song on that album. I just think this song rocks. I love this song. 
Um, in listening to it, I was very reminded of uh, of uh, um, of uh, Wolf Mother. Um, oh, sure. Uh, let's see. Um, Woman and Joker and the Thief, two great Wolf Mother songs. Um, I definitely got a Wolf Mothery type vibe. Um, yeah, I can hear that. Uh, yeah, this is like I would say atypical of what they normally sound like. This is the uh, only album they made that sounds like this, but I really, really. Uh, dig it uh i would say if people are listening to this and they put that on and go like what the hell i don't like this uh you know d- just try a different album they uh you know they they have other albums that sound entirely different from this um um uh let's see um yeah um no uh I could see it being very good driving music. Yeah, 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 very much. Yeah, that I just man, that guitar riff just I think rips. Oh, I I oh, love it, oh. uh, and I really like the way he like kind of bellows the vocals. Uh, I think sounds pretty nice. Yeah, I'm I'm really into this this track in particular. I love mm. a good riff, man. A, a good riff does it for me every time. Mm. Um. Um. Yeah. Uh, having a good opening riff like um not part of my list today but um the strokes usually hit it out of the park with opening riffs like totally you know catchy um, as hell man like really really catchy guitar riffs yeah just like takes you in immediately um really solid really resonate um Julian Casablancas and the other members of the band and the music producers really know what they're doing for the strokes because their songs are all beautifully put together. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. um, What do you do? You want me to keep going through my songs or do we go back and forth? um, I think probably back and forth is okay. Um, Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine. That's great. Okay um let's see uh um so one of the ones i picked was a queen song uh don't stop me now love this song man um probably my favorite queen song um uh the vocals really do it for me um I really like the verses um, and just like that. Don't stop me now. Hook like is so incredible and it's so big. And um, Dude, it's like, I, so- I love the way this song starts as like a ballad. Like it's that slow piano roll and he's singing as beautifully as he's ever sang. And then the don't stop me now and you're like <laughs> and it feels like it's about to break into something but it doesn't it's don't stop me now and then he does another one and then we're having a good time like i love the way that just builds it's so good it is so much fun it just like explodes from there it's great yeah 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 um yeah uh when I get together with like a bunch of my college friends, you know, um, this, there'll be a song we all like sing along to sometimes. And like on a road trip we were on, um, we sing along to it. And I, th- I think it's in the credit sequence of Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, <laughs> Probably. I did not see that movie, but that uh, sounds right. Uh, check it out. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, my, I mean, this what this song reminds me of actually, movie wise, is um, Shaun of the Dead. Um, the I have uh, not seen that. oh, dude, highly recommend Shaun of the Dead's okay. a great movie. Um, and there is a sequence uh, where the movie builds to all the characters being trapped in a bar together as a zombie invasion is happening. Uh, and so the bar is kind of their safe space as the zombies are trying to break in. Uh, and just as things are really starting to to get bad the power comes back on and as the power comes back on that means the jukebox also comes back on 
And so this song starts playing. And because it's a British movie, they do a bunch of jokes of kill the queen, kill the queen, because they need to turn the, the queen off on the jukebox because it's too loud. Uh, mm. And then they're trying to beat zombies off of them with pool cues, uh, but they start doing it to the beat of the song. So it's they're just like to the beat of the song, just kind of like beating zombies with sticks. It's fun. I love it. Um, recommend that movie, man. That's a really good movie. Uh, I think Edgar Wright is a brilliant director. Um, uh, totally. Scott Pilgrim is one of my favorite movies. Hell yeah, man! Really great. Yeah. Um, he, he's doing things really differently. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, man. I know I'm with you. That guy's on another wavelength, and it is a, a treasure to see a new movie by him every time. <laughs> um what would your second song be uh okay so this is a song by keith emerson called i'm a man okay Uh, so keith emerson if people don't recognize that name he's one of the members of emerson lake and palmer um who are like a prog rock band from like the 70s i guess was maybe when they were really big um the reason I put the song on this list is because it's from a movie called Nighthawks, uh, which is a movie that stars Sylvester Stallone and Billy D. Williams as buddy cops. Uh, and they are searching for this terrorist played by Rucker Hauer. Uh, and the terrorist name is Wolfgar. Uh, and this is a cocaine fueled New York action movie. Uh, you can very much tell that the actors are deep into a cocaine binge like uh, halfway through this movie. Uh, And there is a great scene that I just thought was incredible uh, that I have watched on YouTube over and over and over again since seeing this movie uh, where Billy Dee Williams and uh, Sylvester Stallone go to a club because they've been told that Wolfgar always like shacks up with a woman everywhere he goes. So they think if they go to this club, they'll maybe find him trying to flirt with a woman. And they do. Wolfgar is there dancing at the club. And this song, I'm a man is what's playing in the background. And it's an incredible song. It's very much a Keith Emerson song. It's got all these really weird noises in it. Um, It builds in all these like weird directions with these crazy sounds. And the scene is literally just a minute of Sylvester Stallone and Rucker Hauer staring at each other from across the club back and forth. The camera just cuts back and forth over and over and over again as these dudes just stare at each other for like a full minute. <laughs> and then finally, Wolfgar like is it, like turns to pull a gun on Stallone and Stallone screams, Wolfgar! And then they both just start shooting at each other from across the club. It's fucking incredible. I don't know why I like it so much. I just think it's got this like really incredible energy. There's all these great neon lights, which is something I love in movies uh, in the club. I really love that scene. I really love this song. Uh, it's a very unique circumstance to be describing why I like a song, but uh, I, I highly recommend people Google the nightclub scene from uh, Nighthawks. It's, it's awesome. Cool. Um, anything... Anything what Billy D. Williams is in is usually pretty solid. Um, I, I gotta say, I wish that this movie gave him more to do in particular. Okay, um, he, he's like a little bit sidelined by the movie, I think. Okay. Um, he is fun in it, and it's fun to watch him and Stallone as like a buddy cop duo. Yeah, I do think, uh, if I tried to sell you on the movie as hey, it's a Stallone Billy D. Williams buddy cop movie, you'd watch it and be disappointed. Cause it's not like totally good at doing that. Um, but, but that is like what it's doing and trying to go for. Mm, um, no, I think robot cop movies is a very underrated genre. And well, um, this is one that like, I had never heard of before. I, I don't think it's like, you know, um, a very popular movie. I don't, I don't think this is one that, has kind of like stood the test of time. People have kind of forgotten about this movie. Um, I only found it because we did Rucker Hauer on our podcast, uh, oh, on cool. Killer Bees. Um, cool. And uh, 
I just really liked this. I was really taken with this movie. It's totally a B movie, but um, it, it's a really fun one. Mm, um, uh, let's see. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, not to um spoil anything, but um. Rutger Hauer, he's in Blade Runner, correct? Yes, yeah, he's um, you know he's the uh, famous replicant uh, from mm. from Blade Runner. Um, uh, I can't think of his character's name now all of a sudden, but yeah, he's the Tears in the Rain speech is uh, mm. is him. Mm. Yeah, he's a he's a great uh, actor. He's like a Dutch actor, I think. Mm. Yeah, definitely seems very authentic uh, in the movie. Legitimately. Uh, or menacing (laughs) oh yeah uh, he's fantastic in that movie and that's a lot of what his career was um once we started watching his movies and stuff he he played uh like menacing villains pretty frequently yeah um uh yeah i think i've seen some of his later work i'll have to check him out and um uh yeah um yeah i agree um i think he's an actor that there's definitely um he's one of those that deserves a closer look yeah what's uh what's your next song man um i would say say um (laughs) Um, uh, uh, Dancing Days by Led Zeppelin. Um, dude, this was a Led Zeppelin tune I had never heard before. Somehow, I don't. Yeah. I like. I'm not like much of a Zeppelin fan. I like okay. know their big songs. Uh, okay. but I don't. I don't know their discography really deep. So okay. this was cool that you put this on the list because I had never really listened to it before. I thought it was good. I totally appreciate. I think it's off Houses of the Holy. Um, I think it's either off physical. Yeah, it's off House of the Holy because um, I remember looking at the album cover and the album cover of the House of the Holy is really, really captivating. Okay, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and provocative. <laughs> um, yeah. But... Um, uh, no, uh, Dancing Days. Uh, my favorite, yeah, um, my favorite was that one song. Um, uh, like you were saying before, with like um, guitar riffs, um, just a great riff to kind of take you into it, to kind of set the stage for the rest of the song. So it already gets stuff going it gets the adrenaline pump and it gets the energy going and then robert plant just excels mightily with that vocal and he just nails the choruses and the song kind of progresses and it kind of builds and it crescendos at parts and there's it's you know I'd say it's a near perfect song, like to be honest with you. Um for how it's composed and for what it is, it does it really well. And Led Zeppelin really knew how to make music. And it's just a really good um rock song. And it's kind of an anthem-ish. It kind of has in anthony vibe to it even though it's not one of their bigger songs but um it's definitely one of those that uh you can put on and you can kind of like pick up the lyrics fairly easily or like sing along with the choruses like it definitely has like chorus sing-along potential so if you're going for a long car ride you know just put on some uh put on some uh road dancing days <laughs> yeah yeah i'm with you that opening riff was like caught my ear immediately i was like oh this rocks like i was just like so in immediately uh, yeah 
Um, let's see. So in the interest of time, I think we're going to probably cut this segment a little bit short and okay. we'll just do one more song from you. And then we'll talk about the doors. My, uh, I guess I'll make my last recommendation. Uh, Fire Inc. is what the band is called. Okay. And the song is called Nowhere Fast. Okay. Um, this is another one that people should look up on YouTube because it's the opening song uh, from the movie Streets of Fire, uh, which is a Walter Hill movie. Walter Hill directed The Warriors. Uh, it's probably the thing people would know him for most. Um, he also directed a movie called The Driver that I am a huge, huge fan of. Um, Streets of Fire is basically what if The Warriors were a musical? Um, it's like a it's like a gang warfare movie that is also a musical. So, you know, I guess like kind of like, uh, you know, West Side Story. Um, but the music is like all kind of like barroom rock. Uh, and I think Fire Inc. is probably just a band that was developed for this soundtrack specifically. And this opening number, Nowhere Fast, is electric. It is so incredible, I think. And I really think people need to look it up on YouTube because to see what Hill does in the direction and in the editing in these opening minutes of the movie is so stunning and so energetic in such an incredible way. The way the stage is framed with all of these like awesome neon signs behind the band, the way the light show and the editing works in tandem with the lights is really exciting. And then it has this really incredible moment where um, uh, Willem Dafoe plays the villain in this movie. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> you don't, the, the, this song is kind of meant to introduce you to like all of the characters in the movie over the course of it. And so as the song, but it's like, it is a, it's an onstage performance. You're watching a band perform the song, but as they're performing, this biker gang is pulling up to the club that they're performing at and sort of making their way into the club. So as the song is being performed, we keep cutting to the outside of the club and watching this biker gang kind of ride up to the club. And the leader of the gang is played by Willem Dafoe, but he's shrouded in shadow the whole time. So the whole song is kind of building to revealing the villain. And in the final seconds of the song, the lights slowly fade up on Willem Dafoe's face in the crowd. And it is one of the great villain entrances in film history, in my opinion. Like, it is such an incredible moment. There's something about his face in that moment and the way the lights come up on him and the way the song has built the energy to that reveal on his face. I love it. I think it is so electric. It's in fact so electric that the movie never lives up to the potential of this song. Like a lot of people really love this movie. I only kind of like this movie. And it's mostly because this opening six minutes are so incredible that the movie never gets back to being this good, in my opinion. Uh -huh. Um, it, it like promises something that the movie can't fulfill, but it is so good that people should just Google it and watch it. Mm -hmm. um, how is listening to Nowhere Fast on its own? If you oh, it's were great. To listen cool. cool. It, it is great. It's like, it's a really, really great song. And it's, um, I described the music as barroom rock before. That's what pretty much every other song in the soundtrack is. This one is almost like an 80s, like, I don't know, like new wave rock ballad or something like it's it's got more energy than than the kind of rock you you might be expecting from me describing it as barroom rock. Um, it, it really works on its own. It's great. That's awesome. Um, I'll have to check it out for sure. <laughs> Highly recommend. <laughs> um yeah okay um so in like the last 10 to 15 minutes that we've got um let's talk about the doors um yeah. directed by oliver stone a very underrated director um a, a true craftsman um uh, movies films that have his touch are very carefully curated they're usually very well made well edited um some kind of art house. Uh, speaking of Willem Dafoe, Platoon is one of my favorite movies, and that's an excellent Oliver Stone movie. Um, but you know, I've actually never seen that movie, Drew. That's like one of my like shameless movies that uh -huh. I just have never seen. Uh -huh. it, if you haven't seen it, 
you're in for a treat. Like, yeah. it's wonderful and probably my favorite Charlie Sheen performance. Oh, okay. And he's a pretty gifted actor. So, like, but he really shines in Platoon. Willem Dafoe is excellent in Platoon. He's kind of an anti hero. Yeah. Okay. Kind of. Um, and it depends on your interpretation. But, um, Willem Dafoe and Charlie Sheen are both excellent in the movie. And John C. McGinley's in it, too. He's oh, awesome. I love him, man. He's great. <laughs> um, yeah, he's a really fun actor. It's a really fun movie. It's equal parts fun, equal parts intense, but all parts well-made. Um, it's Yeah. I mean, that's like the energy of Oliver Stone, right? Like his movies are like, and I'm not even, I'm not like a huge Oliver Stone guy, but I I definitely like appreciate Oliver Stone. He really does like, he is a fine craftsman. Like his movies are like really, really kind of like carefully made. Um, uh, But they're also like, yeah, I don't know. There's like there's an energy to them, you know, uh that that is kind of unlike anybody else's. He's like I would say he's like clearly like an angry person that like brings a lot of his anger into his into his movies, you know, and I, I feel like mm. you can kind of like feel that in his movies. Mm. Um which is kind of why the doors is interesting, I think. Like I, I actually think this movie is like I don't know, I don't feel like this movie gets talked about as much as some of his other work and I kind of feel like there's something interesting to this movie that exists almost like outside of his other work. There's, it, it doesn't necessarily have that anger in it that I see in a lot of his other stuff. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, like in in rewatching it, like this film is just kind of a journey, and it is kind of a trip. Like it, it, it's a, a real trip. So for like people who haven't seen it, I highly recommend you do it while watching like the while reading the Wikipedia like plot summary or something. Like do something to catch you up because. If you're not a big concert person or a big art house person, you might not get it um, because certain like candid angles or certain different angles and certain scenes are are done to simulate a certain effect. Like, um, like my favorite scene in the movie is like the Andy Warhol scene where um, mm-hmm. Val Kilmer is Jim Morrison. He's like talking to Andy Warhol and. I think he's supposed to be on drugs in the scene. So For sure. the camera is like canted, like to kind of simulate that. And so it kind of simulates being like drunk or on drugs. Like this is how we perceive reality. This is how we perceive the world, which is really, really clever that he does that. But if you don't know that's what he's going for, you, you'd be like, why is the camera that way? <laughs> right, right. Uh, that scene also has that great uh, performance from um, uh Gosh, why can't I think of his name now? Uh, Crispin Glover? Yes, Crispin Glover as Andy Warhol. <laughs> Man, so I love Crispin Glover. And uh, I couldn't think of a better person to have to, you know, recreate Andy Warhol on camera. Because he's not like, he like is doing an Andy Warhol impression, but like not really. But that also feels like exactly what I understand about Andy Warhol. Like it feels like, yeah, that like, like I feel like Andy would be pleased to have had someone do their own interpretation of Andy on camera, if that makes sense to my understanding of who that man was. Uh, and there's so many different versions of him too, that I'm sure yeah. there's probably one guy probably to get it right. Or depending on Andy's mood, he'd be like, this is my favorite today. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, no, but um, I love that they did that. And I, it's a great show case for Andy Warhol's art too and his sensibilities and it would make sense that him and Jim Morrison were friends or they would understand each other because both were clearly brilliant and both clearly saw the world really differently so um uh to kind of center on Val Kilmer's performance um you know I'm so in love with 
his portrays Bruce Wayne and Batman and Batman Forever. I did like that performance a little bit more. And his Bruce Wayne is so likable. Like he, he's such a likable Batman, such a likable Bruce Wayne. Like there's nothing negative that I can say about that portrayal. Like just nothing yeah. negative. But the Jim Morrison, it's so it's super muddy. It's super tangled web. There's so there's so much going on. Um, and I think that's uh, definitely like uh, inherent to the movie, right? Like I, I think the movie is trying to wrestle with a a sort of inherently muddy person, uh, a person that was difficult and a person that um, I think operated in difficult spaces. I actually like my biggest problem with this movie was that I felt like it wanted a. I think it wanted to blame some of the women in Morrison's life for his delusions of grandeur. Mm. It really had, it had multiple women in his life. Yeah. Kind of, kind of say, you know, call him, you know, the big, the big man, like, like try and inflate his ego. And it almost felt to me like it was trying to imply like, Oh, see if it weren't for the way these women tried to inflate his ego, like, he might have been a more balanced person that that didn't you know go over the edge like this, and I'm not into that. I like it. It seems like this guy was a dick, you know. Like, huh. I, and I'm not. That doesn't huh. that doesn't make him like not huh. talented. That doesn't make him not interesting. Mm. But I do think this guy was like a a, a problematic dick, you know, um, and and didn't treat people in his life all that well all the time, you know. Um, but but I do think this movie is trying to wrestle with that. I think this movie is, is and I think that's in Kilmer's performance. I think there is recognition of that uh, in his performance and in in this movie and the way Stone is, is sort of trying to paint this picture. I'm, I'm not totally on board with the way it tries to blame some of those women, in my opinion. But like, I do think it's trying to wrestle with him as a a very complicated individual. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um... The performances from the women in this movie are great. Oh yeah. Uh, um, I, I hate to be critical of female actresses, but it isn't Meg Ryan's best performance. Oh, what well, what do you think is her best performance? I'd be curious about that. What's like, where's I'd your like go to Meg Ryan? I'd say you've got mail. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. How about you? I don't know, man. I, I watched her in this movie, uh, the Stream Campion movie called um, In the Cut. Uh, I haven't which, seen it. Yeah, I mean, I can't necessarily recommend this movie to people. It's a very strange movie that I don't know everybody would be into, but it's really interesting. And she is giving a very interesting performance in it that I just felt like was, I don't know, a little outside of what I understand her to kind of like be as an actress, you know? Um, uh, and I kind of liked that one. Um, you know, it's interesting that this movie is kind of at the tail, towards the tail end, I guess not the tail end, but it's in the back half of her kind of like America's sweetheart part of her career, you know? Uh, and I, and I think seems to, it almost seems like her casting is playing on that and maybe even trying to deconstruct some of that a little bit. Hmm. Um, and I, and I kind of, I actually liked her performance in this quite a bit because of that. Hmm. That's interesting. And you made a really good point earlier saying that the female leads in this are very problematic or that not that they're problematic, but th- that they're written in ways that they enable the Jim Morrison character. And you're, you're not sure if that's an accurate depiction. Um, I just found out today that there's an updated like Doors documentary. I'm not sure if you've seen it. I don't know if I've that not. goes more into depth about it but that's probably worth a look yeah but yeah the females in this definitely kind of enablers um and i mean he certainly doesn't treat any of them well really uh you know his relationship with the meg ryan character ends up being like so clearly abusive uh by the end yeah Um, and uh uh, did you catch, by the way, I, I thought this was very funny. I didn't notice this. I, and I hadn't seen this movie in a very long time. I saw this movie in college and I, I think not since. Uh, the very first thing that Meg Ryan says to him when she meets him, you know, he like is in that tree spying on her and then 
comes into that balcony. <laughs> yeah, b- bad. Immediately bad. Immediately like creepy guy move. Don't do that. Very bad. Never do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but like, you know, he like comes down from that balcony. The very first thing that her character says to Jim Morrison is, don't you like doors? That's the very first thing she says to him. I didn't catch that. Yeah. I, I did not catch that. That is brilliant. That really made me laugh. I was like, oh, okay. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I just thought that was like an interesting piece of writing, you know? Yeah. There's no um, way that's not done with some kind of intent. Yeah. And a stone movie, um, I'm sure you're right. Like, there's yeah. so much care put in, and yeah. it's so big. Like, it's such a big, like, his movies are so big. Like, oh, this movie is huge. Actually, I thought, Drew, you made a great point earlier about this movie being a journey. To me, the most remarkable thing about this movie, because I do think there's like, I have some problems with, uh, again like kind of the way it's telling some of morrison's story and i do think the movie kind of aggrandizes morrison a little bit like it treats morrison like he's like some kind of like almost like you know god like guru figure and i i'm not totally into that read on him myself but so but so that aside to me the most remarkable thing about this movie and to your point about it being such a journey is that you watch this movie and it is a long movie that takes you through what feels like this huge, incredible expanse of time. And then he's dead. And you find out that like, all of this took place over like three years in this young man's life, you know? Like what feels like such a long, huge, like this would be any other rock stars whole career is like three years in this dude's life. And then he fucking dies. Like, it's like, And to me, that was like remarkable. And I think that that is, I think that that is actually what Stone is kind of like driving at in this movie. And the way that he crafted and constructed this movie was to make it feel like this very long, winding period of growth and peaks and valleys. And only for it to, only for you to at the end realize, like, oh, I don't know how I would have survived that either. Like, if I went through all of that in three years of my life, like, I don't know how I would have survived it either, you know? And I kind of think that that's the journey he's trying to take us on. Like, truly how um, powerful and unwieldy uh, this life was for this young man, you know? <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, uh... Let's say, um, kind of from what, kind of what I just got from your take is that it's a three-year period, but the way Stone kind of paints it and kind of illustrates it in the movie and how how it plays out in the movie is it feels like a longer period of time, or it has that appearance. Um, yeah, in watching it, I definitely thought it was like. 10 years <laughs> yeah yeah and then it's just like it's so eventful and i mean it's not like three years right it's like i think we meet him when he's pretty young initially but like the the really like rock and roll god period of his life is like yeah. these like final like three years basically which yeah. is a majority of what the movie is yeah and yeah it just like it gives you this feeling of of it's so eventful that well it must be at least like a decade of this guy's life and it's like no all of that happened in like three years like of course he of course he burnt out and didn't survive it like it you know it, it that's too much life to live in three years you know it's like yeah um i agree and you know for all the jim morrison fans out there there is a new documentary and the doors do have a fair amount of music so you know you can embrace him and in pop culture in Wayne's world too, which I recently watched. There is so much Jim Morrison in that. Yes, sir, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah. And I, what was the other thing I was going to say about this movie? Oh, uh, the other thing I was going to say about this movie, my absolute favorite thing about this movie is Kyle McLaughlin. Uh, He's a as terrific the, actor. The He's a terrific player. actor. Yeah. Totally agree, man. I love him. And I mean, 
I, I'm not afraid to to say it here. Like, I don't know that I've ever been as sexually attracted to someone as him with long hair in this movie, as this like incredible musician who is, in my opinion, like clearly smarter than Jim, like clearly has like a better head on his shoulders and a better kind of worldview than Jim does. And like, I mostly spent this viewing in the movie being like, oh, I know why I don't like this movie. I would rather be watching the movie about this guy. Like, I don't give a shit about Jim. Jim's like an asshole. I would rather watch a movie about this, in my opinion, much sexier rock god who seems like he's like smarter and more talented and interesting than Jim ever was. Mm. It's interesting because I'm not sure if they got along in real life either. Right. I like, I, I kind of get the impression not, right? That yeah. this that one of the things the movie is dancing around is that like these guys I don't actually think got along. Like they they shared a creative pursuit that they were both they, they found a good creative partner in each other, but pretty quickly realized that they were yeah. oil and water as personalities. Mm. Um yeah. I've, um yeah and i think the keyboardist i think he did some stuff for vh1 or he's done some documentary type stuff so mm. if you're interested in the keyboardist i think he still is living and oh, okay. um there is stuff on them there is stuff on him so you can go deeper and um now um anything come mclaughlin very good he's uh, awesome. blue velvet sisterhood traveling pants too you know <laughs> He yes. is a great actor. He is totally a agree. phenomenal actor. Um, okay, um, just before we wrap up, I do want to say that um, for my favorite part of the movie, it was probably how good the music is. Oh, how, yeah. How good they explored the band in kind of a subtle and avant-garde way without having like, okay, like forcing them into the recording studio in every scene or something, or like forcing co concerts, they just kind of unfold. And yeah. okay, they just kind of happen, but it does explore the music pretty thoroughly. Um, and they do like the big hits, like they do Light My Fire, they do Break On Through, um, Riders on the storm. So you Some know, B sides throughout too, though, right? Like that's one of the great things about the movie. I think is that it's scored almost exclusively with their music. I think there's like that's a awesome. few. I think there's like a few tracks that are not them, but it's like almost all their music. And it's a nice reminder of like how expansive their catalog was and how interesting because like their music is great. I do really like their music. Yeah. Um. And some really different songs like uh 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 touch me and yeah so um like they, they do have like some good range some good versatility but yeah um uh if i'm not sure if he's still directing but oliver stone if you're listening um make another music movie i i, I thought yeah. he hit it, i thought he hit it out of the park with this movie i oh, I, I really thought he did a good job and the music scenes in particular, I think, are like really incredible. I mean, there are some really extended concert scenes in this. Um, and I feel like most music movies do not spend so much time uh, in their concert scenes. Right. And they're, they're really great in this movie, I think. Yeah. And because of the number of extras, concert scenes are hard to film. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was th and dude, I was thinking about that through this whole movie. I was like, every one of these concert scenes is so fucking big. And I, it, it just seems like this movie must have been a huge production. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and the film deserves more credit. And of course, Val Kilmer, um, excellent in this, excellent in Batman Forever, a great actor. Um, yeah. He, he really, you know, Drew, this was great because he's not a guy that I thought about as one of my favorites. And just okay. kind of rewatching just these two movies, I was like, oh, I, you know what? I don't, maybe I don't appreciate him enough because he's really terrific in both of these movies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, very good in Top Gun, too. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if, there would be an homage or a 
reference to him in yeah, the, the new, new one. The new one when it comes out, but um, they should because you know he's great. His character yeah. was awesome. Um, well, he I I told you about this off the air, and we might as well like let your listeners know. But he he just produced a documentary about himself, um, mm. that I premiere soon i think or maybe it was just maybe it was just at the con film festival maybe and it's comprised of like a ton of home video footage that he shot himself because apparently he had uh like a video camera like a home video camera you know like in the very early days of that being a consumer product uh Mm -hmm. and so he's been like filming himself since he was like a teenager basically Mm -hmm. and so he took all that footage and turned it into a documentary about himself and he of course now very tragically um uh, suffered greatly from throat cancer, which he is um, making his way to the other side of, but he has fully lost his voice. Um, uh, yeah, due to throat cancer. So, um, you know, the, the documentary also serves as a kind of, um, you know, here's who I have been as an artist and here's who I am now. And here's what I'm hoping to do with the remainder of my career, what it will be. And I'm, I'm very interested in that. I, I, that seems very, sounds good. I, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, yeah, uh, oh, it's called Val. Uh, if people are curious, yeah, um, check out Val, check out uh, Val Kilmer's movie library, um, The Saint, Willow, um, Top Gun, um, Real Genius. Have a real genius. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's a real genius in that one. A real one. Uh, um uh yeah. Um okay. Um everyone, um thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Um this has been the Drew and me podcast um thank I've you been me. garrett smith for being on the show and what's that name of your podcast one more time it's a killer bees podcast that's killer bs podcast everywhere on the internet um, we're on the movie john podcast network uh so that's like the philadelphia john j-a-w-n movie john okay dude thanks for having me this was a real pleasure so much fun Thank you so much for being on the show, Garrett. This was awesome. Um, Have good night, guys.